Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, with my long time, but now kind of new, but old at the same time, uh, <laughs> uh, co-host Jimmy Bucciolato, the doctor. Hi, everyone. Coming back. Uh, he's, he's a utility player. He's going to be kind of um, seamlessly integrating himself back into some of our content, and we're really excited about it because Jimmy's not just the best criminologist in the Midwest um, and, and the best college professor teaching criminology in the Midwest. He's also my best friend, so I'm glad to have him back. Um, Thank you. Today we're going to talk about Milwaukee, uh, the Balistrieri cri uh, crime family, and I want to kind of approach it from two ways. First of all, we, we just had the death of the the last remaining mafia prince of Milwaukee, the last of that era, the, the balustrade mob dynasty that lasted for 50 years or so, uh, was involved in all the casino skimming that you saw in the movie Casino. Um, a, a family of much under underrated prominence at one point um, that really ceases to exist and has for probably 15 or so years, I've been reporting that it's a, a branch of the Chicago Mafia at this point. Um, and John Balistrieri, uh, 75 years old, the son, the youngest son of Frank Balistrieri, the Mad Bomber, uh, died a week or two ago, uh, complications from a fall that he took off a ladder, I believe. And uh, his dad died in 93, his brother Joe, um, in the right on that in the last picture we just saw uh john is on the left uh his brother joe died uh, like 15 years ago so john johnny bell was the last uh last man standing from that i mean there was other balustrades but the, the core balustrades um let's first talk you know, jimmy and i we've talked about donnie brasco before uh we love the movie and uh, everybody knows, or I should say anybody that follows this stuff knows that uh, the film chronicles the the fact that that undercover operation took down a big chunk of the Bananos in New York, and it shows them taking down the Traficantes in Tampa. Did not show, although it's chronicled in the in the book, that they they took down the Balustrieres. Yeah. Um, so that operation took down three. I don't think it took. I don't think the Bonanno, uh the Bonanno boss didn't take down a boss. I don't think it took down that motion lounge crew with Sonny Black. Yeah. Um, no, because Messino didn't go down. Yeah. I mean, it, Rastelli was already Rusty was already in prison. I'm sure there were parts of it that led into the, that fed into the commission case uh three years later but interestingly um he took the, the donnie brasco took down two dons in in tampa and in milwaukee balustrieri's big prison sentence didn't come from the vegas skimming it came from the donnie brasco operation which was a, a shakedown of a uh a vending vending machine company and I think, you know, with the Bananos, obviously, they're bigger, more institutionalized. They they were able to not only rebound, but actually thrive under Messino eventually. Milwaukee, I mean, that in a way... They never you know, responded. We, yeah, right. It's sort of like beginning of the end. <laughs> that was that that was pretty much like they were... It was never the same after that. Uh, so John Balistrieri and his brother were attorneys. Um John went to uh, Valparaiso Law School. Joe went to Notre Dame Law School. Uh, oh, maybe he went to Notre Dame and then went to Marquette Law School. I don't know. He either went to Marquette undergrad and Notre Dame Law School or the other way around. Um, and uh, they were like, you know, big time criminal defense attorneys while, according to the federal government, they were also mob lieutenants. And the, 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 that federal government believes that they eventually got made. Um, there's some reports that they became administrators that those are, that those are unconfirmed reports. Um, but 
isn't that kind of unique too? I mean, I know in Detroit we kind of had that with um, Bill Buffalino. Yeah, Buffalino. Yeah, and then you but, see that with um, Rizzuto now in uh, Montreal. Right, but Leo it's not Rizzuto. very, it's not very common. There are a couple of examples. In Sicily, it was always more common to see like professionals, e- even like Navarra, who was the the, the boss of uh, Corleone before uh, um, Leggio and those guys, uh, uh, Totorina turned on him. Uh, he was he was uh, Dottore Michele Navarra. He, he was a doctor. So um, you, you, you used to see professionals uh, that were made in Sicily, but it's not very common in the United States. I mean, th- these are some of the only examples I can think of. Um, Buffalino in Detroit and and the family in, in Milwaukee. Um, but it's not very common. They were uh, caught on wires in the Brasco, Donnie Brasco uh, investigation. Um, it all kind of came to a head at a meeting that was a, te- I think it was summer of 78, uh, lefty guns and, and Donnie Brasco, whose real name was Joe Pistone came in from New York. Uh, they had an FBI agent that they were working with that, that you actually see in the movie, um, as the other FBI agent. Um, in real life, his name was like Gail Cobb, I think, and his undercover name was Tony Conti. Uh, and they took a meeting with all three Balistreri's and uh, Frank Balistreri's underboss, Stevie DeSalvo, at their headquarters at the Shortcrest Hotel. And they they just lay it out to the undercover, like, you're opening a vending machine business here you're we're we're taking 20 percent of your company you know fyi and you're lucky we don't kill you because you tried to come in here and do this without Mm -hmm. our permission but because we're friends with lefty guns and i think mike sabella was another guy mikey cigars another banano capo or a banano capo um and uh they got it all on tape and i know that i want to get your take on this so it was a, a great piece of insight that John Balistrieri, the the man that just died recently, uh, was caught talking to his, I believe it was his mom. And they were talking and he was talking about how, how much money that the Milwaukee mob, the the Balistrieri family specifically was making through Vegas and saying, Hey, when dad first took over the family, we were a big deal here. We owned a bunch of strip clubs. We made a little bit of money. We kept our, you know, we kept our heads low. And now, since we've got into Vegas, he's like, this was in 1978. He's like, in the last three years or whatever, now we're worth twenty million dollars, which back then was, you know, a lot of money. He's like, what do you think the, you know, the feds aren't paying attention? You don't think this pisses? He says, you don't think this pisses them off? How we went from kind of low rent mob bosses or a mob family to like the penthouse? Yeah. So that was like they played that in court and it was hard for John Balistrieri, the again, the the mafia prince who passed away last week. It was hard for him to explain that. Yeah, I mean, um, that was definitely one of the more lucrative endeavors they were involved in, because um, up until that, I think it was mostly your typical street stuff they were involved in gambling, shy, things like that. Um, they they did have some connections to the cheese industry, which also big, intersected big with, with the bananos. Right. So that was that was actually one of their more lucrative in terms of the legitimate industry. But uh, one thing politically, I want to see what you think is uh, I'm not an expert on Milwaukee. Even at the height of their power, um, they were usually Chicago still had kind of. Yes. Not necessarily could tell them what to do, but you know what I mean? Like politically, it yeah. seemed like they were under the, the outfits uh, or in their orbit, if that well, makes sense. I think Balistrieri leveraged his connections in the outfit and the favor. Uh, he was he was in favor with a lot of the um, north side. Or I don't, actually, I don't want to say specifically. I, I know that he was very close with Milwaukee, Phil Aldericio, um, and some other guys. Uh, I definitely think that he was able to use the backing of the Chicago guys um, 
to take over uh, Milwaukee and and keep his uh, his his tenure unchallenged. The only time he really had a challenge was in the early seventies, where there was this guy named Louis Fazio, who was also kind of backed by the outfit, um, and he was killed. And they got Balistrieri, I believe, at that meeting in '78, talking about it, saying like, "Yeah, the last time I had a problem, you know, he said something like the guy got five from five from a 38." Yeah, and and what doesn't Chicago? Uh, Chicago didn't. They, they wanted them to solve that peacefully, didn't they? Wasn't were, Chicago? Weren't they disappointed that? Yeah, and uh, it was pretty brazen, like in in his yeah. in, in his front yard or his backyard. Um, the Fazio family, I think, had, had some prominence in the restaurant industry louis had been in and out of prison um i know that frank schweiss and the joey lombardo crew were suspected um which is interesting and then you know the last mob murder in milwaukee was tied in some way shape or form to chicago it's still unsolved um 1989 a guy named max adonis who worked for kind of like a Chicago subwing in Milwaukee that was ran by Frankie the Horse Bucheri, um, Fifi Bucheri's brother, who um, you know kind of planted a flag in Milwaukee with a, a woman gangster named Sally Papia, who was like you know like a female Al Capone almost. And Maxi Adonis worked for for uh, Frankie Bucheri and Sally Papia. And he was brokering drug deals with the Milwaukee mob, the Chicago mob, and black drug gangs in both cities. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Um, Rust Belt, Industrial City, Milwaukee, that gangster disciples have a big presence there from Chicago. And they, you know, kind of transplanted to... Milwaukee, and I, I imagine that, um, I, or I at least wonder if the Italians had any kind of relationships with the black gangsters, and then also um, the Outlaws MC. Um, yeah, they have um, a presence in and the Hell's Angels in in uh, Wisconsin. Oh, the Hell's Angels do. I, I believe they I, do as well. I know there's been a lot of Outlaws warfare are. between those two groups in Milwaukee over the years. Okay, but them, but Milwaukee being the, the home of Harley Davidson. Oh, yeah. um, also okay. plays a role in some of that. Yeah. Um, in terms of the gangster disciples, I know that in the investigation of the Max Adonis murder, which as of a couple of years ago, uh, FBI in Milwaukee told the Milwaukee uh, Journal Sentinel that, that the investigation was still open, um, that the subset of gangster disciples that went to Milwaukee were called the, bo- the boss gang brothers of the struggle and larry hoover had actually like created this subunit of his gangster disciples to go to wisconsin mm. um, yeah there's a lot of the gang literature out there uh covers milwaukee that's i was just curious uh and then, then i want to give you one more piece of the, the puzzle in the adonis hit and get your take on it and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, end it but uh so Maxi Adonis was killed by two um, assailants that were described as young black men. Uh, he was working at an Italian restaurant called Giovanni's, which was a big mob hangout. Um, and somebody knocked on the window after it closed and summoned Maxi Adonis out. And the guy that summoned him, uh, according to what investigators believe, he knew who that was. Um, he was gunned down in the parking lot and those two African-American men assailants uh, left, <laughs> left town. A couple weeks later, they were killed. Two years after that, they're dug up in Chicago underneath an apartment on the South side. And they met, their, their IDs match the the two trigger men in in the Adonis hit, so it looks like they were contracted for the Adonis hit, and then after they completed it, they were killed to cover up the tracks. Yeah, yeah. What year was that? What year was that? Again? Oh, eighty nine. The the murder happened in March of eighty nine. 
So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's interestingly pretty, enough, yeah. the Balistrieri brothers came home from prison like three weeks later. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that they were questioned. I know that the FBI believed at first it had nothing to do with the Milwaukee mob. And then I think there's been a, a, a pivot over the years in that investigation. Um, but uh, they came home like three weeks later and then they, they dug up those bodies in April of nine, uh, April of 91. So it was two years later. And then also just uh, not related to that, but just politically because of the, the casino industry, uh, Milwaukee, not only the outfit, but the Milwaukee also had strong ties to Kansas city and Detroit too. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. And um, Cleveland and Chicago and well, we already said Chicago. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the movie Casino, people remember the character. I think they call what was his name uh, uh, Green. What was the name of the the? Um, it was Kevin Pollack played the role. He was that. He was the front man. The front man, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think oh, it was. Okay. I think it was oh, Green. I think the, maybe yeah. it wasn't Green. I don't remember. Anyway, whoever that yeah. was was based on Alan Glick, right? Who was the real front man, um, and Alan Glick was introduced into this mafia fray by the balustraries because Alan Glick had gone to law school with the, one of the balustrary brothers. Philip That's Green how he became was the, was Philip the character's Green. name in the, in right. the casino. So in real life that there would have been no, you know, Stardust Casino, which was in, you know known in the in the movie as the Tangiers, or all that stuff would it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the Milwaukee guys finding the the perfect frontman. So why do you think that maybe to finish up in terms of the decline of this family, do you think it's something that we see in places like Cleveland? It, it's it's happening here in Detroit where it's just attrition, where just like the next generation, the, these guys, uh, their their grandkids, their great grandkids are. Um, become legitimate and um, you don't have any more street guys. You don't have like as many Italian enclaves to recruit people from. And it, it just dies a natural, so, some natural, of it's natural assimil- death. Yeah. Some of it's assimilation. Some of it is, you know, when you get leaders that are more worried about not going to prison than building out the infrastructure of a family or sustaining the family or inf- infusing new blood into a family, I mean, you saw with Cleveland all the way back 40 years ago, really, to to, to, to 50, you know, almost 50 or 45 years ago when, you know, um, Licavoli took over the family from from uh, Scalish and they hadn't made they hadn't made anybody in like 20 years. Yeah. And then he only had a chance to make a handful of guys. So by the time he hit the late 80s, early 90s, there's only a handful of guys uh so it's like if you have a boss that decides that he doesn't want to keep making guys, this is what you're going to have. So it was a I, similar situation to Pittsburgh too, right? Like it's yeah. almost like it's almost like he wanted to bring this to an end. Yeah, <laughs> with with that last generation. Yeah, and uh, I think if you're Chicago, I mean, shoot, it's just more more money uh, even if it's just even if it's just gambling if it's nothing else even if it's just gambling is yeah th- that's the wheel that the economy spins from um there's still and there's i also want to say there's still make guys in milwaukee i've been told there's probably about a half dozen but oh. there is no structure sure the, the last leader was or not leader he was never an administrator but he was a capo uh, libby labrizi who's about 78 now um but i think he's retired He's a guy that had a lineage, his dad and his brother. But uh, there's no formal structure. I think in Cleveland, from what I've heard, there is something of a structure. Mm. Uh, but it's very, very small and somewhat inconsequential and and still kind of, not still, but being puppeted by Chicago. Yeah, even I mean the traditional Cosa Nostra protocol is even if it's just one made guy left in a yeah. in a territory, um, that's still technically recognized as a as a borgata, even if it's relatively inactive. Um, so, it, it, I think it's just it's just interesting. Perfect, uh, Jimmy. Thanks for joining me, buddy. Yeah, thanks. It's good to be back. Hopefully, uh, we'll be doing more of these together. We have some things lined up. Some. Uh, 
a, a return to the the old ways that we used to do things. So I'm looking forward to it. Yep, more just any you know more content, more versatility, um, more opportunities to uh, get what we uh, provide. So uh, for Jimmy B, for uh, Benny behind the glass, I'm Scott Bernstein, OG Pod out. Mm-hmm.